Hi, I'm Mark Gaylor. I'm a Sony Imaging Ambassador and welcome to my review of the Alpha 7C camera. If you do decide to purchase this camera, I have a playlist of supporting movies to help you get up to speed really quickly uh, with the Alpha 7C camera. I've also created a 300 page uh, free to download ebook and then you simply donate what you think it's worth. This should help you uh, uh, to get up and running with the camera as quickly as possible. Now, first, let's take a look at what's new with the Alpha 7C camera. And in the second half of the review, I'm going to go into detail about how I would uh, prepare and create a camera kit. Now, obviously, this is a compact full frame camera, and it really only makes sense if you try and keep your full full frame system light, compact and portable. So I'll be giving you my personal recommendations. OK, so let's take a look at uh, the Alpha 7C. Now, some photographers may be coming up from micro four thirds or APS-C sensors. Now, obviously, the full frame sensor does give you an advantage over dynamic range, high ISO performance and the AF capability of this camera is simply amazing. One of the downsides, however, you do tend to pay a little bit more and the lenses tend to be a little bit bigger and heavier. But we can get around that by choosing wisely. First of all, obviously, people will want to compare this with Sony's other full frame cameras. And here we see it sitting alongside the Alpha 7 III camera. And as you can see, it's not just the camera that is compact. That new kit lens is also compact. And I, again, I do stress that really this camera only does make sense if you are looking to try and keep the entire kit compact. Now let's take a look at some of the new features. Obviously um, we have seen this very, uh, very angle uh, screen appear on the A7S 3 camera but now it's also appeared on the A7C. Now that does allow you to get in front of your own camera for either selfies or vlogging and that is a very useful feature. It also allows you to turn the screen around so when you're putting it back in your camera so if you throw your car keys into your camera camera bag there isn't a risk that you're going to damage that monitor. There is the movie button where again we saw this on the Alpha 7 um, S camera, the 3 camera and uh, this uh, is either a dedicated movie button but you can also uh, reprogram that button into a um, custom key if you're wanting to shoot stills. Obviously you can see um, on the other full frame cameras we do have a couple of custom keys on the top of those cameras and those are gone now but we can reprogram that movie button if we want. Now, one of the um, advances in the uh, um, uh, shooting movies on this camera is that we do have all of the autofocus improvements, and that does include IAF in 4K. So if you're out there shooting with your f1.4 or 1.8 aperture primes, you're always going to have reliable focus on that eye. Now we also have the improved AF on button. It used to be just for people perhaps wanting to assign it to a custom key or use it for back button autofocus. But now we can be in AFS, a single focus mode. And if we decide to press the AF on, it overrides that, puts it into continuous and starts tracking the subject nearest your focus point. If you have a wide focus area selected, it just goes for the subject that's uh, closest to the center closest to the camera and uses that very simple algorithm. 90% of the time it automatically starts tracking what it is that you want to start photographing. We also have uh, touch focus and touch tracking. Now we did have touch focus on the older alpha cameras but now we can go into the function of touch operation and uh, change it from touch focus to touch tracking. We also have touch shutter if we want to touch and take a picture. But now a touch tracking is perhaps one of the great features is if the subject suddenly starts moving we simply have to touch it on the monitor and the camera will then follow that subject subject. It's also great if we're maybe filming and we decide that we want to walk towards the subject. We just touch the subject and it will hold focus. We don't really have to worry about pulling focus as we move. 
We also have the Animal IAF and we have seen that on other Alpha cameras as well. But usually the Animal IAF is uh, disabled if we go into AF tracking. Now the A9 cameras do support Animal IAF and AF tracking combined and the Alpha 7C joins those cameras. And so that is another great feature for uh, enabling a higher hit rate when we're photographing dogs on the beach, let's say. The other thing that uh, some people will notice that may be missing on the Alpha 7C is that um, the multi-selector, otherwise known as the joystick. Now some people who want to move focus point quickly when using the EVF or Finder may think, well, I don't have that option with this camera. But you do have an alternative, and that is to use the monitor as a touchpad. This camera also joins the Alpha 9 cameras that we can use the touchpad to move a focus point onto our subject and then start tracking that as soon as we take the thumb off the touchpad. So it sort of acts like the multi-selector or joystick without actually having a multi-selector or joystick. And that works really quite efficiently on this camera. One of the things you'll also notice on that, this camera, if you do like shooting in um, 8 or 10 frames per second in the high drive mode, is that uh, we have a very large buffer on this camera, much larger than we've seen on the A7III and A7R3 cameras. We can reliably shoot over 115 uh, compressed raw images before the camera starts slowing down. If you compare that to maybe 80 or 90 images on the A7 III, you can see that is uh, an appreciably larger buffer uh, that we can shoot uh, continuous action. Now, one of the things that has been a popular request, and I'm not too sure why this wasn't backdated to the older Alpha cameras. I can't see what, what would inhibit Sony by making this available. But of course, it is available on the Alpha 7C camera, and that is the ability to change the uh, focus um, uh, color to either a bright white or a red color. Now, the old color would be gray, and if we were using um, a spot AF point, it was very easy to lose where that focus point actually was before we started moving it. Now there's no such danger because that will always stand out, whether it be white or uh, red. One of the other advantages, and we first saw this with the Alpha 7 R4 camera, was Sony released a, a digital um, shotgun microphone. Now, most microphones record in analog, and then the signal has to be recorded to dig digital or converted to digital. But this is a true digital microphone that passes a digital signal via the uh, uh, multi-interface shoe on the top of the camera. It's a very light portable uh, microphone. It doesn't require batteries, and it uh, um, its uh, uh, recording quality is simply excellent and so we have that advantage that if you are again wanting to shoot uh, movies with um, professional quality audio you do have that option of using that new digital microphone on the top of the Alpha 7C camera. Now many people who are wanting to move around and shoot movies will often investigate um, things like uh, uh, stabilizers, gy uh, gyro stabilization. Um, now you can buy separate devices for this, but um, the, and again, this can, the Alpha 7C shares an, um, an Alpha 7 S3 feature, and that is uh, gyro data stabilization. We can switch steady shot off in the camera and then stabilize the footage in post-production. And it is very, very smooth. It looks like the camera was actually in a rig to stabilize it. And so we do have to lose some of the crop. So I do um, recommend that you shoot slightly wide. You should also increase your shutter speed uh, above and beyond what you would normally do, and then uh, apply any sort of um, uh, movement blur in post-production. But it is an option, especially for people who want to travel light. It's another bit of get, uh, gear, uh, gear that you simply don't have to pack because you can do that in post-production. Now I've created this chart. Some people have only um, noticed a few things, uh, improvements over say an Alpha 7.3, but uh, all of the features here marked yellow are improvements over the A7 III. Now many of these are to do with the focus. It's the next generation autofocus systems that we're enjoying with the Alpha uh, 7C camera. And I have to say it's the next best thing to an Alpha 9 uh, sports action camera. It's uh, tracking capability 
capability is simply simply astonishing. The other um, advances are all to those movies, such as we have AF transition speed, AF sh uh, subject shift sensitivity. We obviously have that monitor that swings out and faces forward. We have the 4K IAF uh, touch tracking, the digital audio in, the recording limit has been removed, and we have that gyro data stabilization. So as you can see, there are many new advanced features. Now, uh, it's not all improvements, I have to say. Because of the compact nature of the camera, we are going to take a little bit of hits, and that's basically to um, the ease or um, speed of using the camera via custom keys. Obviously, we have less custom buttons on this camera. We don't have the multi-selector, but I showed you a workaround for that. Now, the um, EVF or Finder is a little bit smaller, but it is the same resolution. Some people wearing glasses, like myself, uh, actually find it's slightly easier to get a view through the viewfinder um, than using the um, the other uh, finders that we find on the larger full frame cameras. Um, now I don't spend most of the day looking through the viewfinder when I'm doing street photography. The camera is only raised for a second or two, so I have to say that I don't particularly notice uh, the fact that the viewfinder is much smaller than what I'm used to on say my Alpha 9 camera or the Alpha 6600 APS-C camera. Now we uh, obviously we reduce the number of custom keys down to just a single custom key, the trash can on the back of the camera. But again, I did highlight the fact that we could use the movie button as another custom key as well. Now, um, we uh, do um, reduce the maximum um, uh, shutter speed of this camera from one eight thousandth of a second to one four thousandth of a second. That is really only likely to be an issue if you're shooting at f with an f1.4 uh, aperture prime in bright sunlight. You might say, well, I need to use an ND filter if I'm going to use that 1.4 aperture. Otherwise, I do risk overexposure. There is also um, a drop in the um, the maximum shutter speed before going into high speed sync from one two hundred and fiftieth of a second to one one sixtieth of a second. Obviously, there is a new shutter mechanism that's different to the Alpha Seven III camera in this new Alpha Seven C camera. We also, uh, and I'm not too sure how some people will respond to this, is we cannot disable the E front curtain shutter. Now some people will do this when using non-native Sony lenses with fast shutter speeds or non-native Sony flash systems. Now obviously that is not going to be an option. Now that's not a great uh, disadvantage for me because I predominantly use Sony lenses and Sony flash. So I'm not going to miss the, uh, the, the option of uh, switching that E front curtain shutter off. But that is to be noted. Let's move on to um, uh, beyond what's new, what's different, but on to how we can keep our camera system small and compact and lightweight. Uh, Mike O'Connor uh, photographed this um, shot and I'm actually uh, the middle person in this silhouette here. And I actually told Mike, I said, oh, that's me in the middle. And he said, how do you know that's you in the middle there? And I said, I'm the only one not carrying a backpack or a large tripod. Um, tripod. I'm very much in favour of travelling only with the gear that I know I will use that day and no more. I'm not in favour of carrying everything and the kitchen sink around on the off chance I might use something. So the Alpha 7C, the compact version of the full frame camera, is certainly a camera that will find uh, a place in my own workflow. Now I've been using cameras of this size and weight uh, probably all of my career. I started uh, in 1980 using analog cameras where they were almost identical in size and weight to the new Alpha 7C camera. So I find, find these very comfortable to carry around either with a kit zoom or a prime lens. And so we're going to be looking at how to keep that weight in your hand down and also the weight down in your messenger bag because I'm basically done with carrying backpacks. I don't want to be a gear mule anymore. I want to be able to carry just a few kilos in a, in a small and light messenger bag. 
Now there are some photographers who um, would prefer to use um, um, a 7, 10 times zoom lens and I have to say the, the advantage of an Alpha 7C system will start to dissipate because what i have um, showing here is the uh, Alpha 7C with a 7.5 times zoom. This is the Tamron 28-200. Now obviously that is going to be a much larger lens than the equivalent lens that we would use a seven and a half time zoom on an APS-C system. So as you can see here is I've got my Alpha 6400 with a seven and a half time zoom which has a full frame equivalent of 28 to 200. It's the 18 to 135 lens and you can see this package does come a lot smaller than working in full frame. Now we do get an advantage in the full frame camera that we have much better high ISO performance but the whole system is getting uh, sufficiently larger now to put me off this particular workflow and I personally would if I wanted to use a seven and a half time zoom I would probably stick to the APS-C cameras. So what I'm going to do moving forward now is show you my preferred system when working with the Alpha 7C. Now uh, that uh, last slide was the kit lens on the Alpha 7C and two f1.8 primes. That's the uh, FE20 f1.8G which has just uh, won um, prime lens of the year on the DP Review 2020 awards very fine lens indeed and it gives you the wider uh, field of view than the kit lens which um, uh, goes as wide as 28 so if I'm doing astro or landscape that 20 mil is going to cover that gap there and I've also um, added the FE 1.8 the 85 1.8 is a fabulous portrait lens it's light it's portable it's inexpensive and it's in sharp wide open. In my opinion it has better bokeh than the Zeiss Battis lens which is larger, heavier and almost twice the price. So all of that gear comes in at just 1.53 kilos or 3.37 pounds. You can see that is a very light combination and that will photograph 90-95% of what I intend to shoot when I'm shooting editorial, documentary, street narrative photography. All of that goes into a light portable messenger bag. This is the Think Tank Mirrorless Mover i30 and you can see right at the bottom of this image here I have an iPad Pro and the bag is no bigger than the length of that iPad Pro and you can see the, the small um, uh, messenger bag is not even crowded because of the fact that that um, kit lens does collapse in on itself or um, to take up very small space in your messenger bag and uh, there is a picture of me um, taking um, the Alpha 7C out of that messenger bag and to give you an idea of the size I put that inset image there to show you that um, uh, this uh, uh, messenger bag can be carried uh, in a very indiscreet way uh, in, uh, in the street. It also is small enough and light enough to pass as that second bag when you're boarding an aircraft because it will push in uh, underneath the seat in front of you. So um, some women might um, carry a handbag, some uh, business people will carry a laptop bag. This sort of fits into that category so it's not going to be your only carry-on bag for most airlines. Now obviously uh, Sony have embraced uh, not just the camera in this uh, compact system but also have turned their attention to the lenses and I hope that this won't be the last um, zoom lens that they turn their attention to. You can see this uh, compact kit lens coming in at just 167 grams 5.9 ounces really small. It will remind you of that FE35 f2.8 Zeiss lens if you've seen that. It is really quite a tiny lens. Now some of you may say oh well I really wouldn't want the, the quality that comes with using a kit but uh, I'm going to post a link in the info section so you can see the quality that this kit lens can achieve. It is actually pin sharp corner to corner. Yes there is barrel distortion at the wide end 
but um, the uh, the camera corrections if you pick up the profile if you're a raw shooter or if you apply the um, camera corrections in camera if you're shooting JPEGs or movies this is uh, fully corrected and it is sharp corner to corner as you can see from this large 4k image I'm showcasing here and this is another image that I captured, one of the very first images. I actually acquired this uh, camera to review whilst I was in quarantine after returning from the UK to Australia. And this is the quarantine yard in my quarantine hotel, small patch of sunlight in the exercise yard there. And so um, we can see um, this lens is, is going to find a place in most um, people's camera bags. And it's certainly worth considering purchasing at the time you purchase the camera. So rather than buying body only, you add in that lens because it's going to cost you a couple of hundred dollars less if you make that or if you add that to the kit at the time of purchase. Now it doesn't have a very wide aperture, but one of the beauty of one of these 24 megapixel full frame sensors is yes you might be shooting at uh, ISO 800 but if uh, in a really dark environment if that ISO climbs over 6400 you're still going to get usable images without reaching for one of those f1.8 primes this 4k image was actually captured at ISO 10,000 and it's still serviceable now let's uh, compare this um, camera the Alpha 7c with other compact full frame cameras. There are only a couple on the market. A lot of people wanted to compare it to other full frame cameras only and they missed the, the fact that um, uh, Sony also had to uh, there had been set a benchmark such as by companies like Sigma FP camera and uh, this is a, a little bit smaller but the Sigma FP which is approximately the same price as the Sony Alpha 7c doesn't have uh, sensor stabilization and it doesn't have a viewfinder. So um, Sony are packing in a lot more stuff into a package that is only a very small amount bigger. If we compare this with uh, another full frame camera, this time the Sony RX1R camera, which is a very expensive camera, much more expensive than the interchangeable lens Alpha 7C. But you can see with that little pop-up finder, which is actually smaller than the finder on the Alpha 7C, so everything is relative, you'll see that uh, the Sony Alpha 7C isn't that much larger than this little pocket camera. And if we look at it side on, um, the Alpha 7C is a little bit um, fatter. Um, but if we combine that with, say, the 35mm Zeiss f2.8 to try and match the 35mm lens on that RX1, we see that we're not out of the ballpark. We're actually getting down to a very manageable size, even though we're comparing it to a fixed uh, lens uh, camera. Let's compare it to Micro Four Thirds and you see that it's um, smaller than common Micro Four Thirds camera, this one from Olympus. It's not only smaller, it's also lighter, but it's got a sensor that has got four times the surface area of that Micro Four Thirds sensor. So if we compare it to a popular um, uh, APS-C uh, format camera, we'll see again it's still um, lighter and smaller than that camera, and yet we've still got the luxury and benefits of image quality using a full frame camera. So I'm going to show you my full frame kit now and I'll just put it all out on the table now, not just the lenses, but we'll add in a spare battery, a spare memory card, a wrist strap, a peak design clip, um, a little tabletop tripod and uh, an external drive for backing up all of my images. And we've got to 2.75 kilograms, still extraordinarily light. Now I've got the beauty of having those two um, ND filters they are able to use the 67mm diameter which is shared by both the 85 and 20mm lenses so I've got uh, one set of filters that fit both of my prime lenses. Now if I add in all of that and you want to measure all of that, this is packing weight, this includes the lens caps, it includes the back caps, it includes the body caps, it includes the batteries and the memory cards inserted in the camera and you've got that 2.75 kilograms. 
Okay, so uh, and I've even added in uh, the um, the mirrorless mover bag into that uh, weight there. So we're looking at a very light kit that comes in that under that three kilo mark. If we want to extend that kit out even more, um, we've got a full kit now. Um, we're looking at uh, maybe a Sunway Photo LED fill light if you're a, a videographer or you're just using this for additional uh, fill light, even as a stills photographer. We've thrown in a battery charger, a Peak Design clip. Um, we've got a, a remote in there and uh, we're still keeping that weight down. And uh, even throwing in an iPad Pro and uh, all of those cables, etc., you're still going to get down to um, four kilos maximum. And obviously, if you're leaving um, some of like things like the iPad Pro in a hotel room or the boot of the car because you're not walking around with that, you've basically got 3.2 kilograms uh, in that bag, and that bag uh, weight will drop even further once you've got the camera in your hand. If you're leaning towards a slightly larger messenger bag because you're wanting to maybe put your sandwiches, a raincoat, an umbrella, etc. in there, um, oh, the one that I currently use is uh, a Brixton Owner. It's a very sort of um, uh, luxury, uh, sort of leather, uh, Italian styled leather bag. And you can see there's plenty of room um, to uh, um, even put a 13 inch laptop into this um, larger bag there. Um, now occasionally I will photograph uh, sports, action, uh, wildlife, birds in flight, but um, I will not break up the small light messenger bag for this. I will put maybe my Alpha 9 II camera with FE 200-600 lens in a separate very small backpack there and uh, the total combined weight of my um, uh, small messenger bag and this additional bag is coming in at the seven kilos which is the international carry-on weight for bags going on to airlines and you'll see that uh, the size of that small bag you could actually get both of these bags it's a little bit of a squeeze but you could get actually both of these bags into the wheelie size bag now that will be a little bit heavy you might have to take both cameras out to get it back down to the seven kilos because those little wheelie trundle bags that um, go in the overhead compartments on airlines are often um, nudging two kilograms in weight themselves now here are uh, some um, accessories that movie makers might want to uh, add in. Uh, there's the shotgun microphone which is very small and light. Uh, I would typically also carry the Bluetooth, Bluetooth uh, microphone system um, from Sony as well and um, also you might be using that Bluetooth, Bluetooth grip as well. Uh, all very light portable uh, accessories for movie making and all will go into that uh, larger kit bag at a squeeze they'll even go into the smaller messenger bag uh, if you don't mind uh, crowding it out a little bit. Now I'm very much in favour of this uh, very light portable workflow. Uh, Bluetooth, there's not a cable in sight here now. We've got the wireless system on the top of the camera. We've got uh, the wireless remote and the wireless grip there. And uh, just remember you could walk around with that grip. Um, you will get shaky footage but you can stabilise that in post now with Adobe's, uh, sorry, um, Sony's free software which is that Sony Catalyst software. Some people might want to organize all of those accessories. You don't want to be throwing everything loose into your camera bag. Um, so you might want to push those into little accessory bags. My Leo Photo MT-03 tripod goes into a little uh, bag. So that tripod isn't gonna scratch anything if it's going inside the messenger bag. My microphone, that is the standard little case that comes with the shotgun microphone. And I can actually squeeze in my um, uh, a lapel microphone there, my Bluetooth um, uh, microphone there. And um, my filters will typically go into a filter wallet, my cards go into a card wallet, my battery goes into a little uh, case as well to keep the airlines happy. And I'll often take an international uh, travel adapter as well, which also goes into a little case, uh, which I'll throw into the larger of the two messenger bags. 
Talking about tripods, I'm I'm over big tripods. I know a lot of people carry them, um, but I very rarely use those big tripods now unless I'm in a studio. I can hand hold at the very first light of day, even at f11 with low ISO. The steady shot on these cameras is so good now, one has to question why you're putting the camera on a tripod. Now, occasionally I will use a tripod, but usually only when I'm doing astro or I'm using ND filters to smooth blurry water. Now I have used this Leo photo for when I'm using very large telephoto lenses. It's a very small low tripod, but it is exceptionally sturdy. But if I'm only using those lighter F1.8 primes, I will lose a half a kilo and go straight to that MT03, the Leo photo, coming in at just 8.5 ounces or 243 grams, including the small ball head there. And I've got some of the numbers there. There's a range of ball heads here. I've chosen the lightest of the ball heads there, which just comes in at a minuscule 83 grams there, but it does what I need it to do. Um, I've um, using my Peak Design clip on the bottom, which is an Arca Swiss plate design. Now, typically I can't be fussed looking for my hexagonal um, key to remove that plate if I ever did want to remove that plate. So I've added some uh, small rig D-ring screws to the bottom of my plates. It is a little bit fiddly in that you have to find the right D um, ring um, quarter inch thread for the particular um, uh, plate that you're using. Uh, on that dual plate I find that I'm, I'm actually using an extra washer with a slightly longer D-ring screw. But if you're using the older version 2 um, plate you can just um, use the, um, the, um, the longer thread on that D-ring. Now uh, when I'm using those small light tripods and I decide that I do want to smooth the water, uh, this is the angle of view that I'm adopting. You can see another photographer wearing the yellow jacket there, he's hand holding, that would be what I would be doing if I didn't need the longer shutter speed. Typically I'll put the camera on the tripod, I'll add the ND filter, I carry the smaller screw in ND filters again to save weight and now I can pull that 2-3 second exposure just long enough to smooth the busy choppy water in front uh, of this um, iceberg and because I've taken that lower vantage point I've created that heroic landscape. Now by taking that low vantage point you're always including the foreground in your landscape shot which helps build depth into your landscape shots. 90% of my landscapes would be recaptured very low to the ground with wide angle lenses um, because I prefer to include the foreground in my shots. And here's another example of that. Um, again, long exposure, ND filter, tabletop tripods. This time the tabletop tripod is actually in the water, just enough to keep the uh, camera out of the water. And here again another example uh, in New Zealand South Island and I've got the uh, the beach there in the front of the water. If I was standing or extended the legs on a larger tripod I would not have the beach or the incoming wave in the shot and the uh, landscape would be a lot less dramatic. So to cut to the chase with filters, um, I'm using these Freewell magnetic quick change filters because I can uh, move the filters very quickly from my 20mm lens to my 85mm lens. Um, uh, and uh, I just put one magnetic uh, ring on each of those lenses and then I can just uh, pull those filters off and move it over very quickly. Now I don't uh, pack a macro lens, I don't do a lot of macro but occasionally I do want to get closer to some small detail. So what I've chosen to do is just pack um, uh, a macro extension tube, a 10 millimeter extension tube in my filter uh, bag there, which will um, decrease the minimum focusing distance of my 85 mil prime. So I'm definitely in favour of using these screw-ins. I have used the Nissi square filter systems with my 1224, but when I'm travelling really light out of messenger bags, I really don't need the extra one and a half kilos of filter system. Uh, I can simply work with those screw-in filters. 
Um, typically I will work with uh, only um, one additional card uh, now and I will be uh, moving those cards over either to my tablet or my laptop. The advantage of having an Alpha 7C is it does have that USB-C connection so you could actually dispense with the need for a card reader, another small um, uh, weight saving thing. Uh, obviously having that USB-C interface now on the latest Sony cameras does mean that we can empty off uh, uh, SDXC2 cards with the 300 megabit, uh, megabyte write speeds off to our laptops um, very, very quickly. If you're looking to save another kilo in weight, you could shift from maybe a 13 inch um, laptop over to a tablet. Um, Lightroom has become very feature rich over the last couple of years and so you're not going to be losing out much by taking that route. Um, if you're traveling where you've got good Wi-Fi um, connections, you can also upload your full resolution raw files to Adobe's Creative Cloud, uh, creating that backup as you travel. The other thing that was announced and will be available shortly um, um, as well at the same time as the Alpha 7C was a much smaller flash um, unit, um, the um, uh, HVL-F. Uh, 28RM so it's one of their radio flashes their new radio flashes so you can um, trigger and control off-camera flash with this flash as well now you'll see that there's no um, LED window on the back of this um, uh, unit and that's because with the new flash systems and the new firmware that's come in to the new cameras now is we can control all of the flash features and off-camera flash as well from the monitor or from find a window we don't need to have those controls on the flash as well so we're getting the size and weight of that flash system down as well and yes it is a less powerful flash than say the 45s or the 60s but all we need to do to compensate is just double the ISO and then we will have um, the power that we need to light uh, the subject matter if you do uh, want to lose that flash altogether, uh, I found that the dynamic range and um, of these sensors is so good now that we can actually underexpose slightly to protect our highlights. So one of the things that I've started doing is when I'm at parades or demonstrations or events I and we've got full sun, I will uh, backlight the subject matter. Yes, the subject matter will be a stop underexposed, but then I'll just use a radial graduated filter in Lightroom and add that stop back in. It's basically using fill light, but instead of via flash, you're using it in post-production. And the shadow quality, uh, the underexposed shadow quality is so good on these sensors is we don't lose any image quality by doing this in post. So another example here again, backlighting the subject, take the harsh lighting off the subject. The backlighting has also contributed to the backlighting behind the smoke to highlight this underexposing slightly just to protect those highlights and then adding the fill light with that radial filter in post again. Obviously if you're looking to build that kit out above and beyond uh, the kit lens then my recommendation would be not to go to the f1.4 primes but to go to the lighter cheaper smaller f1.8 primes. On the left we have the prime lens of the year 2020 as judged by DP review the 20mm f1.8 uh, G lens. It's spectacularly sharp, uh, wide open, has very little um, color fringing so it lends itself to astro as well. So uh, perfect for um, landscape. Um, we have the uh, the 35 and 55. These focal lengths are covered by the kit lens, but if you're really looking for extra low light capability, um, more capability to drop the background further out of focus, 
then the, the 35 and 55 are very good sharp examples fast focusing all of these lenses are very fast focusing so you could shoot sport with any of these lenses to be honest and we have the 85 mil f 1.8 i voted this lens of the year one year um, because i couldn't believe that this uh, lens wasn't branded as a g uh, lens um, so it's uh, affordable light and pin sharp wide open and makes a perfect um, portrait lens when on location you don't have to stick to the Sony choices. The um, Zeiss make um, lenses for their E-mount system. Um, these aren't super small, but they're usually very light. So we have the 18mm Batis, which I have used and loved, but now has been replaced by the 20mm Sony. Um, we've got the 25. I probably wouldn't use this one either. It is a very sharp lens. Um, uh, an f2 uh, lens I prefer the f1.8 on that 20 mil but it is a cracking lens we have the 85 mil Batis I actually think I prefer the Sony version at half the price but what we do on uh, we have a very interesting lens on the right side we have a 135 2.8 now Sony make a beautiful 135 prime, 1.8 prime, but because of that longer focal length with the f1.8 aperture, it does start to pack on the grams. Here we are nudging towards a kilogram now. Whereas if we choose that 2.8 aperture on the Zeiss Batis 135, we can keep that weight down. You can see there's 614 grams or just 1.35 uh, pounds. I have used this lens. It is um, sh uh, sharp. It is fast focusing. So you, again, you could shoot sport with this lens and you can shoot into the light without much risk of flaring at all. So it is a, it is a non Sony lens that I have used and would recommend. Okay, so I've got some examples here. The um, the 18 mil lens I have used and loved, but now I use the 20 mil. So a couple of examples of the landscapes I've shot with this. Uh, I have used the 25 mil for landscape as well here. Um, so sort of a bit of an action landscape with that crashing um, rock here, and also um, a, a, a dawn shoot in the Grampians in Victoria. Uh, first light of day. Again, I do stress this is handheld um, using an f11 aperture with the ISO at probably no more than 100 to be honest. So those tripods really uh, are not needed in these instances because we're not using long exposures to blur water. So I have used the Batis. I was using the Batis 85mm before the Sony was released. A cracking lens. I would typically recommend that you use it wide open. Um, the, the straight um, uh, aperture blades will create that hexagonal bokeh if you start stopping down to f2.8. You do get the, the best bokeh by just leaving it wide open at f1.8. Um, as you can see here, the, heck, uh, the bokeh would start to deteriorate if I started stopping uh, this aperture down. And I have used the 135. I've used this at um, an event and shot a, a complete event uh, with the, uh, the Zeiss uh, 135 2.8. And as I said, it is a fast focusing lens here. So I've used this uh, for triathlon shoots uh, wide open and I've got a series of shots. They were all pin sharp uh, following this um, uh, uh, cyclist speeding past me. Obviously, there there are more primes. There's there's a lot of primes. One of the great things about E mount is uh, everybody's making lenses, so you can get cheap lenses, you can get light lenses, you can get really expensive expensive Leica lenses. Now, this is sort of um, uh, for people who really love the feel of these manual focus um, Leica mount lenses. These are made by Voigtlander, so significantly cheaper than the Leica versions. They are very light, very portable, solidly uh, metal built construction here. Why I'm showcasing these now in the Leica mount is if we were to attach them through the TechArt Pro Leica M adapter, 
we could um, then put them onto our e-mount systems and gain autofocus with these manual focus lenses. We can also get steady shot. So we're basically bringing these lenses into the 21st century now by acquiring uh, vibration reduction and autofocus over these manual focus lenses. We will even have IAF when we're using these lenses. So this is certainly something to be considered. And you see there it's in action. Some people will just love the retro feel. I don't have any images yet of these lenses on uh, my Alpha 7C camera, but I will try to test this out on the system. I have used the Voigtlander uh, Leica mount uh, lens, and I am more than happy with the corner to corner sharpness. Uh, the, the low vantage point did mean that I did have to keystone this image to correct the converging verticals, but you can see um, what a glorious sharp image uh, this is. And I, again, if you go to the links in the info section, you'll see the, um, um, the high resolution images. Uh, because I do adopt that low vantage point with long exposures, I will be keystoning a lot when using these ultra wide angle lenses, say at the 15 mil uh, focal length here. Um, this is again on the first week of my shoot with the Alpha 7C using the 2860 kit lens. You can see that if we get nice and close for a tight head and shoulder portrait, we can still get figure and ground separation even though the aperture now is only f5.6. The downside of doing this however is the ISO has climbed to 6400 in this instance, so we will start getting noticeable noise around this point. We can clean it up in post-production um, using localized noise reduction or noise plugins like Noise Ninja, etc. But obviously, if um, you've got that 85mm f1.8 in your camera bag, you are going to switch out because you're going to pull that ISO down below 400 usually, uh, even in low ambient light. And we get much more pronounced figure ground separation. Again, this was captured with the Alpha 7C camera. And even though some of the, that foliage behind um, uh, Tegan's head here is very close, it's, um, it's just blown out into bokeh. If you're using that f1.8 for events and you're getting uh, three quarter length or full um, length uh, figures, you're still going to get that figure ground separation. You're pretty much going to be shooting wide open. You might find a little bit of color fringing that you have to remove when shooting wide open on the 85 1.8. It's not as optically perfect as, let's say, the 135 G Master lens, but um, and you probably would switch that out if this is what you were looking for, a more optically perfect, but you are going to add uh, quite a lot of weight by doing that choice. I have even shot sport with the 85mm. Now you obviously are going to have to get close to your subject matter using only an 85mm focal length and you might have to crop a little bit more aggressively in post to make heroic uh, sports action images but just to show that it is possible if you can get close to your subject matter is this one was actually captured with the Alpha 7C using one two thousandth of a second. If you can get closer, of course, um, uh, obviously this uh, is going to improve dramatically. Now, I will get close occasionally. Um, I'll go as close as I can to the closest focusing distance of the lens. Sometimes I don't get as close as I would like because of the minimum focusing distance. So in this instance, uh, I've cropped in um, um, in post-production to get closer still. Now, if you're the sort of photographer who maybe wants to photograph wedding rings or something, and um, but you don't want to carry that macro, then that's where this extension tube, the macro extension tube, which supports autofocus, comes in handy, is this little Mickey Mouse here is only five and a half centimeters uh, tall but we can get him pretty much to fill the frame in horizontal orientation uh, with that 20 mil, um, sorry, the 10 millimeter extension tube. They usually sell these tubes in pairs. You can get the 10 millimeter and 16 millimeter. So if you can't get close enough with the 10, you can switch out to the 16. You can even add both of them together uh, to get really close and fill the frame. 
And here's a, a typical uh, shot taken with that 20 mil. It's going to be wide enough for most landscapes. I won't say every landscape. So what I would suggest that you do if you don't want to carry an additional, say, 15 mil focal length lens is simply turn the camera into vertical orientation, do three vertical shots with a 50% overlap, and that is going to give you that ultra wide angle of view. Even if you only had a 24 mil as your widest um, prime lens, three of these vertical shots with that 50% overlap is going to give you a 16 mil mil uh, angle of view in this particular landscape so you are going to get that dramatic perspective you are just going to have to create that panorama in post um, obviously I've used this um, lens in street photography with very low ambient light so this is a high ISO image in very dull conditions and so this is really where the advantage of the f1.8 aperture because um, I also need to pull a reasonably fast shutter speed because the person is walking so I'm going to need that one two hundred and fiftieth of a second and so yes I'll let that ISO go but this is the sort of shot where the kit lens might struggle uh, in these low conditions if you're looking for really shallow depth of field using wide angle uh, and the the weight of uh, maybe an f1.4 uh, prime lens doesn't put you off perhaps one of the lightest f1.4 primes that is manageable in the messenger bag kit is sony's um, uh, G Master, the 24mm G Master. The advantage of having that 1.4 on a 35mm focal length, sorry, a 24mm focal length, sorry, I got that focal length wrong there. The 24mm focal length is that you can um, pull that figure ground separation when you're doing these half length portraits. So in this image, I am blurring the background. If you've only got a 2.8 aperture, things are going to start coming into focus quite quickly. Um, without those 1.4, 1.8 apertures. For those people who can't maybe afford the G Master lenses or perhaps even say the G lenses, there are a couple of um, uh, cheaper primes in Sony's lens lineup. Perhaps uh, one of the better ones is the 20mm f2 lens. So you're obviously going to get a couple of stop advantage from that kit lens and it is sharp, um, uh, it's a sharp lens. Now they do also have a, a 50 mil, but it is a little bit slow focusing. It's probably um, Sony's cheapest um, 1.8 prime, but it's a little bit slow focusing for me, so I can't recommend it wholeheartedly. So if we're looking at lenses smaller and maybe larger than those 1.8 primes I've been looking at, um, you might want to go for that little Zeiss lens. It's I think it's probably the smallest prime lens, E-mount prime, certainly in Sony's lineup. It is just 120 grams or 4.3 ounces um, and it is spectacularly sharp. So if you're the sort of street photographer who does stop down because you like a little bit more depth of field, then obviously um, this lens might be of interest to you. I have used this a lot in street photography and it is super super sharp and if you prepare to get up close and personal with your um, subject matter you can pull um, a bokeh in the background um, by just getting very close to the subject matter as you can see from this uh, sunflower shot here. You don't always need f1.4 for creamy smooth bokeh because it's a mixture of the focal length and your distance to the subject as well. So the 135 primes. Now, look, I'm not going to go into, you know, 200, 600 mil lenses today because if you are interested in those super reach, then maybe the Alpha 7C is not the camera for you. So maybe I'm going to just look at um, the smaller telephotos and the 135 primes. As I said, this is a 135. This is the Zeiss lens. And uh, if I needed that 200 millimeter reach, 
I would simply crop in post. You could go into APS-C mode in camera or just crop in post. You can see how much we can crop into a 24 megapixel shot and still pull out a, a 4K image, 3840 pixels. And that does give you that uh, 200 millimeter reach. So yes, if we can't get close to our subject, we can just crop a little bit tighter. Same exercise, this time done with the 135 uh, G Master lens. Spectacularly sharp, I have to say, but even with this lens, I've cropped in really tight on the Alpha 7C in this instance. But the autofocus was absolutely astonishing uh, with this G Master. The, the, G, the 135 G Master is a really fast focusing lens. It's got the dual linear AF motors that we would f find in their top of the range 400 and 600 millimeter prime sports lenses and they put those in the 135 lens. So in this sequence of shots um, captured with the 135 G Master they were all pin sharp. I'm blasting these off at uh, eight frames a second on the high drive mode. Typically when I'm panning the camera I'm avoiding the high plus because I don't get the live view in the viewfinder so I'm panning with the high which is the eight frames per second. And um, uh, if you did want reach but you wanted to keep the weight down now I'm going to um, um, showcase something that may not be for everyone because if you do take this option you're now shooting in 10 megapixels. Now you only need 8.3 megapixels for 4K so 10 megapixels doesn't sound like a lot but if you can get close to your subject because you can zoom in or walk in then 10 megapixels is enough for a lot of photographers. So what I'm showcasing here is the APS-C 70 to 350. It's fast focusing, it's sharp, but if we use it on an Alpha 7C, you do drop the resolution down to 10 megapixels, but we do have a full frame equivalent reach of 105 to 525. But this little lens is light and it will go into your messenger bag if you are the sort of person who doesn't want to lose out on that reach. So uh, these 4K examples will be available for you to look at. And I found them perhaps sharper than some of the full frame zooms that uh, I've seen, the lightweight full frame zooms coming from, say, Tamron. They've got a 70 to 300, which is um, pretty much the same weight as this APS-C. But I have to say, the, even though we're leg less megapixels, the image was noticeably sharper. Um, it's not always how many megapixels, it's the quality of those megapixels. So if you are cropping down to 4K, then I was finding that I was getting sharper images by using this APS-C lens. Challenge is, is you just have to fill the frame when shooting because you don't have the option to crop aggressively in post anymore. So uh, again, these are all examples shot. Now I actually have cropped in and um, more aggressively here, we've come down to two and a half K. So people viewing on a 4K monitor now will start to notice that we're losing image sharpness by cropping this aggressively. One other option that maybe um, you might want to consider instead of the uh, 2.8 um, 70 to 200 G Master, which is a big heavy lens, you might decide to go for the F4 70 to 200. It is a sharp, fast focusing lens from Sony. So you can see it's 100, sorry, 840 grams, 29 ounces there. So it is very sharp and you could get that extra reach and it does um, fit into that messenger bag. It's going to take the full height of that small think tank messenger bag I was showcasing earlier, but it does fit. So again, this is another way of getting reach, but this time with a full frame zoom lens. And this might be long enough now to shoot sports in full frame with that and also give you the luxury of being able to crop a little bit more aggressively. Okay, so these are all shot with the Alpha 7C and 70-200 F4. 
fast, uh, fast focusing and uh, a good option there. So if you were going to um, switch out the 85 mil for this 70 to 200, you are going to add half a kilo in, in your uh, messenger bag, but you're still at just over two kilos there. So it, it's, it's still feasible that you're walking around with a very light messenger bag with this three lens kit here. Just to showcase uh, some of the longer reach lenses side by side here, we have that Zeiss Batis 135, that's smaller than the G Master 135, obviously. Uh, it also shares that 67 millimeter thread that the 85 mil and 20 mil Sony lenses have, so that might also be appealing. We have the 7200, these are all um, um, in size so they are the correct size uh, size by side in this diagram here and then we have perhaps one of the smallest uh, full frame uh, lenses that we can have and get reach and that's the 70 to 300 Tamron also having that 67 millimeter filter thread I have to say although it, it did keep up with running dogs on the beach and it was acceptably sharp I would say that it's not pin sharp so if you are a bit of a pixel peeper and like to zoom in when you're editing your images you're not going to be completely wrapped as you might be with say the Zeiss Batis or the 70 to 200 Sony here they are a little bit softer I would say they're acceptably sharp but they're not pin pin sharp another example there we've got the um, um, the G Master 135 on the left we have the 70 to 300 Tamron, the 28 to 200, and the 70 to 200, giving you an idea of some weights, sizes, filter sizes. And the other thing also that I've listed here is um, um, the physical length of the lens. You also want to factor in is if you are doing this exercise is the closest focusing distance of the lens. You know, for instance, the 135 Batis uh, does actually get quite close to your subjects. So you do want to factor that in because that is going to be important if you want to avoid macro as well. So uh, maximum reach uh, minimum weight is probably that 70 to 300 at just 630 grams. But as I said, for people looking for ultra sharp lenses, maybe what uh, one not to pick this was actually captured with the 70 to 300 so if you're looking at this on a 4k monitor i have ramped up the post-production sharpening from the default of 40 to perhaps 110 you know to try and milk the sharpness a little bit so you might say okay this is looks quite sharp to me mark and but i have tried a little bit harder in post to um, to to get that image sharp and again another image captured with that 70 to 300 again it's acceptably sharp I have to say but um, people who are used to zooming in to the 24 megapixel images would notice the difference and here as I said um, it's it's reasonably fast focusing as well you are going to drop a few shots in sequences perhaps more than maybe some of the Sony lenses but you are going to get a few hero images from the sequence here okay just highlighting that compact system again because if you're interested in this camera this is really perhaps where you're focusing you're steering away from the big heavy full frame lenses because that is going to erode the advantage of choosing the Alpha 7C. This is not an upgrade for the A7 III. If you're quite happy with the form factor of the A7 III and maybe using some of those white telephoto lenses, my recommendation would be just to wait for the A7 IV or if you're interested in sports photography, go for the Alpha 9 or if you're interested in resolution go for an R. This is another specialist area for the full frame giving people who want to use messenger bags rather than backpacks. Okay so if you found this information useful give me the thumbs up make sure you follow me head over to my website all of the learning resources on this website are free to download if you find them valuable then I just invite you to make a small donation. Sony do not pay pay me to make these resources I do these uh, and uh, I, I use the donations to support the time it takes to both make these and distribute them okay so uh, head out, you know you'll probably know that on my um, website um, and also on my 
Alpha Creative Skills YouTube channel. I've got a movie to help you master every feature of your Alpha camera. Um, so again, I'm Mark Gaylor, Sony uh, Imaging Ambassador, and I'll catch you online next time.